Hey guys, it's Bass Beast JD, a brony musician extraordinaire, and you guys are listening to the MBS Show. Hello there, and welcome to the MBS Show. I'm your host, Daniel Envy. Joining me this week is Norman Sanzo. Hello. Hi, Norman. How have you been? Mm, I'm fine. You know, I'm the only one who's joining you every week, right? Well, yeah, or you can put it the other way around, as, I'm in, as in I'm the one who's joining you, but since today I'm hosting, well... True, Dad. It's just you and me, always. Mm-hmm. Well, not for this week. I mean, last week we had nobody on. This week, we're also joined by a very special guest. Please welcome David Quazeda, a.k.a. Bass Beast JD. Hello, all. Hello. So, hi, JD. How's your week been? Um, my week's been pretty good so far. How about yours? Oh, my week's been okay. Kind of depressing, but... Oh. Well, I've been seeing the end of the rainbow, so things are beginning to turn over. That's good, that's good. I'm doing well. Good to hear. Mm-hmm. As always. What do you so, mean, as always? <laughs> well, you're always having a good week. I haven't come across you having a bad week yet. I don't share my bad weeks with somebody. I cry alone in bed and wake up next morning feeling good. That explains everything. All right, before we move into the show, JD, we have four extremely important questions to ask you. All right. So the first one would be, who is your favorite pony? Oh, man, favorite pony. I always get a lot of heat for this answer, but my answer is always the same. My favorite pony is the one and only, the great and powerful Trixie. Why? (laughs) No, I'm not surprised at all, but um, why? I love her just because her sheer confidence because just like okay you have to make it takes a lot of confidence to go out in a brand new town you've never been in before and just perform and be that cocky and that confident as she is and i just admire it about her yeah she can be a little brash and boastful sometimes but come on she is awesome that is true optimism you are just seeing one totally good side about her that i have never seen yet (laughs) thank you very much for that i have to be honest i kind of like trixie but It's from the fanfic point of view. You know how fanfic writers are. They always... Sympathize with her. Yeah, sympathize with her and make her look great and stuff. But how the hey did you like her just from watching the show? At first, when I first saw the episode she was in, I didn't really like her. (laughs) But she did leave a bad impression. She didn't leave a bad impression, but like, she like... When I first saw her, I was doing this like... Well, because, you know, it was the first time watching the episode. I was just gathering, like, the information. I was like, okay, she's the antagonist. Let's not side with her immediately. And then, like, as the show went on, like, as that episode went on, I was just like, you know what? She's just misunderstood. She just needs a hug. So, for that matter, since you like the kind of confidence, how do you feel towards the Flim Flam Brothers? I love the Flim Flam Brothers. They're hilarious. They remind me of me and my best friend, Michael. (laughs) Awesome. This is cool. We haven't had anyone say the Flim Flam Brothers are their favorite Uh... ponies yet. (laughs) <laughs> Didn't Hazi say she liked them? Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> Don't really remember. Need to double check. All right. So the second question is, surprises, which is your favorite episode? Oh, man. <laughs> favorite episode definitely has to be um, Lesson Zero. Ooh. Why? Very good choice. Psycho Twilight is best Twilight. Need I say more? <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Oh, man. No, Agreed. not really. But, like, I love... A lesson zero just because when Twilight was freaking out trying to get find her assignment and get it turned in, I know exactly what she was going through because I had literally the same exact experience going on during my senior year of high school. I think a lot of us can relate to that episode in that exact same Oh oh yes. Assignments, deadlines. Yeah, I think that, that episode that episode had to be one of the most relatable episodes to the bronies just because most of us are older and we know deadlines and we know that kind of pressure or we are experiencing at the moment <laughs> yeah so that episode came out when i was in uh, when i was during my it was during my semester it was close to a deadline and i'm like assignment's due but i've got time for ponies and it was, it was like a slap in the face daniel get back to work <laughs> get back to work yeah <laughs> don't you like that all right lauren fox has spoken back to work <laughs> Okay, so, for our third question, this is something a little different. How did you become a brony? I became a brony after 
I was at my friend Jason's house, and my good friend Adam was there with us, and he was on YouTube, just chilling around on YouTube, and then he pulled up a video, and he says, hey, J.D., come over here, watch this. It was the Solrak video for Find a Pet, <laughs> <laughs> and as I'm watching this, all I can think is, what the heck is going on? Because <laughs> I'm seeing ponies, and like it starts off with this brilliant musical number, because being a musician myself, I was listening to the music, and I really was enjoying it. I was like, okay, this is a pretty good number. And then I just hear Solrak start screaming, and I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> I mean, at first, I'm not going to lie, I was the guy who wasn't really a fan of the show. Like, I've heard a little bit about it, but I didn't really pay much attention. And then after watching this video, I was, they were like, hey, you know, just watch an episode of the show. It's actually a pretty good show. Just give it a shot. And I was like, no way. No, I'm not going to do that now. Well, then I got home and I got to thinking about it. I was like, you know, that video is actually pretty funny. Maybe the show wasn't that bad. So I came home and I watched um, The Friendship is Magic, the first episode. And the next thing I knew, I was halfway done with season one. <laughs> it always happens. It always happens. Glorification by music. This is... Oh, yeah. This is very interesting because sometimes the music is... Some... Because we had a couple of guests once. They said that they skip all the songs because they don't like listening to songs from cartoons. And they didn't know what they were missing. That... Oh, that makes me sad because the songs are amazing and they're written by two absolutely stunning composers. I mean, Daniel Ingram and William Anderson are just masters. Yeah, can't agree more. True, true. So, for that matter, how do your family and friends react to you being a brony? My friends are actually fairly open. I've actually converted a lot of my friends into the fandom just by, like, wearing the brony t-shirts... Or just posting stuff on Facebook. Show me your um, ways. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I need to learn this. Yeah. Like, the first... When I did the Long Way from Equestria cover, before it before it went on to Equestria Daily, I put it on my Facebook page and my Twitter, and a lot of my friends were listening to it, and they're like... They were just listening to it, and they're like, okay, I heard your cover of the song. It was beautiful. And then I heard the original cover of the song... And I had no idea that it was about ponies until they said Equestria. So, And then, like, they started watching the show to get... Because they want to know, what is this Equestria about? What is, what is so good about it? And then as they watched the show, they understood how... It's probably going to sound rather pedestal of me. Pedestal of me, like, putting myself on a pedestal. But, like, I think Equestria is actually a pretty utopic society. I mean, there are problems, don't get me wrong. There are problems in Equestria, but compared to as far as the states go, it's pretty utopic <laughs> because compared to this world for that matter <laughs> yeah as far as my family um my two sisters i have an older sister and younger sister they love it like they love the show and they are very supporting like my older sister would buy the little blind bags oh. for me <laughs> at her work because she used to work in one of the stores that sold them Awesome. My, my youngest sister loves it. She loves the show. She watches it when she can. My mom and dad, my dad likes to crack jokes at me for liking the show a lot, but it's never like rude jokes. Like it's just my dad and I just going back and forth like we always do. And Same here. <laughs> yeah, my mom actually, I think she likes the show. I mean, I don't think she watches it, but she is very supporting. Like she has one of the little um, McDonald's Rainbow Dash toys on the dashboard of her car. And that's just awesome. <laughs> Me so jelly right now. I have the pinky <laughs> pie hanging from my car's uh, rear view mirror. Car nice. <laughs> my nice. I don't have one. I want one. <laughs> but yeah, most everyone's been really supportive. That's really interesting because you've got your friends bronified by music as well. Oh yeah. Well, because they always hear me going on and on about music and like some most of them when they when they start hearing me talk about theory. Uh, composition and they're just like okay you need to be quiet because we're not understanding what you're saying <laughs> but so, um really because that's just shows how powerful music can really be exactly hey about your little sister does she like any bronies i don't think she's as involved as the as the brony fandom well as far as the fandom goes i know she's really into the canon part of the show but i don't think that she has explored much of the fandom yet does she know anything about the fandom um, she knows we exist. I think that's about it. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, like, like it would be. I don't know. I, she just doesn't like. I don't think she just like she doesn't just like go around the internet. I guess I don't know. <laughs> okay, it would be a shame for her if she did not know about Mendo Pony and Dusty Cat or 
yeah. the rest. Like, it would be a shame. She's heard some of the songs. Like, whenever I, like, get her from school or drop her off at school or something, I always have something to play. She really likes Acoustic Brony's song, I'll Fly Higher, the Scooby-Doo song. She really likes that song. That is a really touching song. That's one of my favorites. I do the same with my brother when I'm picking up from school, and every time he puts his finger next to the radio, I'm like, I'm the driver. You sit down, listen. <laughs> no, but he doesn't like Brony music. I put everything on. I have Balloon Party in my phone. I have Mando Pony. I even have your stuff in my phone. And he's like, can we listen to some mainstream stuff right now? Like, seriously? Mainstream stuff. So, now that we're done with our intro, let's head on over to the news, see what's happening. Today's news topic, the first one up, the two best friends... If you heard of that series, they posted two best sisters play on Facebook. The link is in the show notes. And recently, on the two best friends play Facebook fan page, they posted a trailer for the two best sisters play Resident Evil 4. The response from the community has been hmm, a little mixed. But with some liking it and some others, they don't like it that much. They disliked it, in fact. And a fun fact from here is, the animator for two best sisters play, Two Snacks, he's the same animator that does the two best friends fun time adventures, which is featured on Machinima's Happy Hour on YouTube. Links, once again, are found in the show notes. So, anybody followed that series? Uh, loosely. Mm, yeah. I like the series, seriously. It's like, how do I put this? Two friends playing a game. And one is very good at playing video games, and the other is not. So, hilarity ensued. I mean, I could totally imagine that being my brother and I, because if that is the opposite, my brother, he can play any video game. When I'm playing a video game, I'm basically the one who's like, what does this button do? <laughs> and I'm a complete looter. I'm like, uh, Daniel, go over to that, uh, that door or whatever. It's like, no, 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 wait, there's some money on the other end, or there's some items on the other end. Pick it up. It's like, the most useless thing in the game. I don't care. I want it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can just imagine it's the same thing. When I was playing RuneScape back then, I'll be like, there's burnt chicken on the ground. I'm like, can I take it? What's it for? Nothing. But I want it. Maybe I can sell it at the shop. You don't get anything for it. I still want it. I think your life is two best friends play. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, um, the animator, they do really good animation. If you watch the animation for two best sister play Portal 2, he oh, did it and... so good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the two best sisters play Resident Evil 4. I can't wait. It's going to be so awesome. All right. So, uh, JD, would you like to take the next news topic? Um, yes, I will. Pirated fashion style ponies. On the Taobao, you can find, like, there's knockoff versions of the fashion style ponies. And they come in little nest boxes with, like, combs and hairpins and all that good stuff. And, like, well, the knockoffs. How are you going to know the knockoffs? All the boxes are just decorated. There's just alicorns everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... Like, there's Alicorn Pinkie Pie, which, I mean, that's amazing. I can't think of anything better than that, really. And <laughs> there's Alicorn Rarity, Alicorn Rainbow Dash, Alec- I think there's an Alicorn Fluttershy. Yep, there he is. Yeah, and links can be found in the show notes and all that. When you um, said there's Alicorns everywhere, I'm imagining that one meme where Woody and Buzz... <laughs> <laughs> Alicorns, Alicorns everywhere. <laughs> but seriously, um, this is kind of... Good looking. Yeah, yeah, I think they look good. I can totally imagine them. Looks on how many brony spaces when they turn around the box and they see like, wait, who's this? But yeah, the thing I, I noticed excited. about Chinese ripoff ponies is that I actually have a couple of knockoff ponies and they look extremely fake. So, I mean, my knockoffs that I bought were the G3 ones because I was that dumb. <laughs> and uh, basically, they have less hair than the originals. Much less. I'm not sure. By this picture, it looks about the same or less looks less to me and they look basically like the knockoffs that I have and uh, they're, they're really the hair is like so little it's like two yeah. little strands when you look at uh, even the McDonald's pony has more uh, more budget but the but box art buy or not to buy no but the box art like what is up with the box art well it looks like some Chinese fellas have been um, photoshop art. no it's not even art it's just photoshop seriously actually you're right <laughs> now that you've mentioned it yes the model is Celestia's model and they just the main is the same, yeah. They just recolor it. Like, oh my gosh. Uh, Alicorn Pinky is still best Alicorn. Alicorn Pinky, okay. best Alicorn. No party? We'll send you to the, not even the moon, the big balloon in the sky. <laughs> oh, that sounds so evil. That sounds exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so, um, the next story. Norman, how about you take this one? Okay, this will be interesting. Um, alternate introduction to Princess Luna. In a recent Sparkle World magazine, they published a short story of how the ponies of Ponyville first met Princess Luna. 
In this version of the story, Celestia sent Luna to watch the annual Ponyville race. And the main five are still scared of her. Things to note in this story are Princess Luna is still in her season 1 form. She still uses her royal cantaloupe voice and has an old English dialect. Twilight is afraid of her. And Pinkie Pie is the one who made friends with her first. Links can be found in the show notes. So guys, what do you think? I must learn the way of the pie. I mean, <laughs> right, it's something so scary. I mean, if somebody twice my height walked into my town, started wanting to do stuff, and you know, somebody can just walk up to it and make friends with it, I'm like, you have to show, you have to share me, share your secrets with me. Well, technically, your... you have to read the story to get the whole gist. Like, I'm just highlighting the things that I noticed in this story, and. This is kind of interesting, really. Like, if this were to be an episode in Season 1, this would be awesome. Yeah, I mean, they could even do a flashback in Season 3. But the whole story of how they introduce Princess Luna is in Season 2, and it doesn't fit well. Yeah, kind of. But I'll be really fun. I didn't really like Luna Eclipse. Oh, you're going to get a lot of hate mail. <laughs> oh, bring it, man. We need some mail. Okay, guys, guys, for all of you Luna fans, Daniel has a Twitter and it's at St. Pinky, so bombard him with hate over there, seriously. <laughs> I'll respond with love if I'm available. Oh, anyway, let's move on. Okay, so finally, last but not least for the week, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic wins the Tubi Awards for Best Animation. Congratulations to Hasbro Inc. and DHX Media. It looks like the ponies have completely dominated the competition. FIM has won Tubi Awards for the Best Animated Show. Guess what? The Washington Post has covered it. Check out the links in the show notes. And, I mean, was there ever any doubt? I have to see who the competition is. That's true. We should see see what the competition is. I mean, I'm not very... I'm not very... um, Familiar with the Tubi Awards, but heck, it's an award, so yeah. it's something to celebrate. Yay! But awesome, we we finally get an award. Like, we got nominated, but nothing more than that. Yes, it's finally good to see this show on the shelf. True, true, I true. I mean, true. come on, it's so lovable. and Just the writing. The writing is good. Yeah, this, I mean, the script writer has all really, really put a lot of work into it. And big shout out to Megan McCarthy and Amy Keating Rogers and all of you at DHX and Hasbro who made this possible. Big hugs and congrats to you all. Yay, congratulations, guys. So now that we wrapped up the news, that's great news. We haven't had this much news for a while. Indeed. So, yep, let's move on over to guest time. And to today's guest time, our guest is Bass Beast JD, a talented Brony musician. He does orchestral covers of songs. And now he's heading a great, huge project on YouTube called The Long Way From Equestria Project. So, JD, you want to tell us more about what you do? Um, yeah, sure. Like you said, I do orchestral covers of songs. I do original songs as well. I'm trying to wean myself away from covers just because I'm starting to write a lot more original stuff. I mean, I'm still going to do covers of both like popular songs, like mainstream songs and brony songs alike. I do orchestral covers just because I love classical music. I love just strings and woodwinds and brass instruments. I think they just sound glorious together. But I do love a lot of other types of music. Like there's very few types of music that I don't appreciate i guess i guess you could call it i don't appreciate some types of music just because they don't i don't think that you could really call it music in my mind well it's like because like a lot of the stuff today like that plays in the states it's just like it's really repetitive and as far as music as far as the musicality of it goes it's just not very artistic yeah it's a lot of the same chord progressions just switched to different keys like the axis of awesome they're a comedy band from australia they did a song called The Four Chords Song, which is just like <laughs> all these pop songs. Oh, yes, with I've heard the same that. Four chords. And it just proves that a lot of music, I mean, it's written artistically, like, I mean, no one would guess that they're the same exact chord progression, but there's a lot of songs today that use like the same samples, the same drops, the same beats, everything. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, it's just getting kind of boring. I'm just like, okay, that's cool. How did you get a contract? <laughs> <laughs> Just for being sexy. It's like, Yay. Uh, it's like a garage band era and everyone uses loops these days. Just drag and drop. Yes. Hey, I'm a composer. <laughs> uh, and then that makes it a part of uh, like real composers, like professionals, like who go to school and like actually learn the tricks of the trade and all that. When they try to compose something, someone will listen to it and just because it doesn't follow the 145 Allegro chord progression, or 145 progression, sorry, the 145 progression in Allegro time, 
with the kick snap pattern, they just assume that they're not gonna, that no one's gonna like it when they don't even give it a chance. Yeah, I've noticed even three four time these days is already off to some people. Yeah, like I love three four time. Like three four and six eight, it's one of my favorite time signatures to compose in. Oh, you're more of a compound time guy. Oh yes, definitely. That's good to hear. So Norman, do you have any questions for JD? Yeah, sure. I have some. So JD, how did you get the name Base Beat JD? <laughs> there is a actually pretty hilarious slash long story behind my alias name. Oh, we have um, all the time in the world. <laughs> okay, we were playing on Xbox Live a while back, and this was like back in the days of like Guitar Hero 3, Rock Band 1, like old Ooh. games. Yeah, this was a while ago. All right. And my game attack on Xbox Live was just basically like everything else that I used. It was just David underscore Q-U-E-Z, just like my email or whatever. It was just really simple and nothing special about it. And I've always been a bass player. Like, like I learned how to play guitar first, and then I transitioned to bass, and I loved it. Like, I love playing the bass guitar. It's my favorite instrument ever to play. Yeah, it's so and body and all that, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's, it's, it's lovely. I, I love playing my bass. It's, it's, no, nothing makes me happier. Like, <laughs> if I'm having a bad day, I just grab my bass and just start playing. I'll play for hours on end. It's more um, challenging and- than the bass in Rock Band or Guitar Hero. <laughs> Yes, yes, it's but like I, thing, I still but do yeah. love. Yeah, I still do love playing the bass guitar on Rock Band and Guitar Hero, just because I love seeing the other bass lines and like how they sound in the other songs. Well, we were playing one day. We were playing on Rock Band One. A lot, man, that is so long ago. <laughs> we were playing on Rock Band One, and um, I picked the bass track like I normally do. And we were playing a particularly hard song. I don't exactly remember which song it was. It was. Um, I can't remember for the life of me which song it was, but it was a hard song on the bass. It was a fairly hard song. And as we're playing along, um, the vocalist who is who we met over live was just singing the song, whatever, we're all playing. And then there was a break in the song where, like, the vocalist stopped singing and the other instruments goes, and there was, like, a small little, like... Solo? Cool little bass... Yeah, it kind of like a solo. It was more like a, just like a bass riff. Like, the bass did a really cool, like, ascending and descending arpeggio. Ah, and then, like, I, I hit I hit the notes perfectly because it's a song I've played a lot before. And then the soloist goes, man, you're a bass beast. And I was like, huh. Ka-ching! <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> and then the JD part comes from my nickname when I was in um, medical school. In, during Well, not medical school, but, like, there were some medical classes in high school. And the popular American show Scrubs, <laughs> the main character's name, JD, um, <laughs> we were... We were running around in the medical class, and one of my friends just picked me up over his shoulder, and he started spinning me around, and I yelled, Eagle, like <laughs> JD does in the show, because I love the show, and I love JD on Scrubs. It's hilarious. And thus, I got the name nickname JD, so I was thinking about it, and I put the two together, and I was like, this is going to be my new alias for everything. And it stuck for the past, like, three, four years. Wow. That is an awesome name. <laughs> so I, I take it as a lot of people just call you JD? Yes. Even though it does not match with your initial. Yeah. <laughs> I have like a billion and one nicknames thanks to uni. Like I walk down the staircase, Hey, yo, brony! <laughs> <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> oh, boy. I'm the light and then I'm sitting in class sleeping on my laptop. Hey, pony boy, wake up! <laughs> oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> I, I've, I've been called pony boy in high school. <laughs> they, they, call, they call me all sorts of things like, you know, sir. So. Oh, you want to know a new nickname for Daniel here? Oh, yeah, what's what? that? Sergeant Pinky. Sergeant Pinky. Come on. <laughs> no, that, that's what happened on Brony Phil when we were listening to their live stream and I sent them a question in the chat and my handle was S-T-P-I-N-K-I. It's supposed to be Saint Pinky. He read it as Sergeant Pinky. I'm like, there's no G in that thing. <laughs> How did you read it as Sergeant? I'm not from the military. <laughs> well... At least you got a new nickname. <laughs> no, I reject that. I mean, I've got enough nicknames. Thank you very much. Okay, um, my second question is, how did you came up with your pony sona and the cutie mark? Um, the cutie mark is actually a picture that I've liked for a really long time. Like I've seen, I've seen it all over the internet, and I've always like used it as the background on my phone or whatever. It's just, I just like it. I think it looks cool, and I'm, it's it's artistic because it's music and then the heart, and you know, it's just 
I think it's cool. It's really cliche. I've seen it on like three different OCs, but it's all right. I just say that those OCs are my <laughs> sisters or brothers or whatever. You're the first OC I've seen it on, actually. Sorry, um, for the rest of the world that are probably wondering, what is your cutie mark? Could you just explain to them what is it? Oh, yeah. I forget they can't see this. <laughs> um, it's, it's a heart made out of an upside down treble clef and a bass clef. It's really common. Just su- just Google like um, music clef hot and it'll show up. I promise. <laughs> just really simple, but it's really. I think it's. I call it intricate, but it's really not that intricate. I guess. I would love to see it done in an Octavia style. <laughs> I think that can be arranged. Yeah, that that look really awesome. awesome. And then as far as my OC goes, he's just like a kind of a darker blue Pegasi with a purple and white two tone mane. And then, of course, he has glasses because I wear big, thick, frimmed black glasses because I love my glasses and I can't see without them. It's the... <laughs> totally. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, I refuse to be called a hipster. <laughs> Why? Because it's I... too mainstream? <laughs> oh, I'm going to hit you. <laughs> well, JD, you do have that one free ticket to slap him. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. I might use that. But he looks cool. Yeah, he is. You look very cool, especially, um, yeah, all those videos on YouTube. But why a Pegasus? Um, I've always loved Pegasi. Like, I've always, like, they've just been one of my favorite, like, mythical creatures for ever since I discovered them. Like, the first Pegasi I remember seeing was the one from the Disney movie Hercules. Oh. Ah. I always forget his name, and I feel so bad. It's Pegasus. <laughs> Pegasus. Oh my god, that. And it... <laughs> <laughs> Mind blown. Yeah, because I always think I'm like it's it's not something simple. It's something creative. No, not really. What is that Pegasus name? He is a Pegasus. What is that Pegasus name? Sounds hmm. like a who wants to be a millionaire question. <laughs> exactly. And nobody's it's... gonna choose that answer. I could be wrong, but if I remember right, it's Pegasus. It's, it's a Pegasus. 50-50, and they won't choose that answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's so obvious. Dung, dung, dung. Is that your final answer? No, sir. The answer for what is the name of the Pegasus in Hercules is Pegasus. Thank you very, for, thank you very much for playing it. Like, what? The, probably kill yourself after that show. <laughs> probably. <laughs> okay. So next question is: I've noticed that you do orchestral cover. What is your inspiration behind that? I really don't know exactly. <laughs> I just I love writing orchestral music and like I love just like my favorite thing to do in my spare time is well, I go on YouTube and I look for different versions of songs just because I love hearing how other people interpret music. Because I've heard some, like, the craziest stuff on YouTube. Like, the YouTube community never ceases to amaze me. Because, like, I've heard, like, crazy, like, death metal songs rewritten in the style of, like, 1940s big... or 1920s big band. Ooh. You need to show me some. And, <laughs> if I can find some, because they're so hard to find, because they're so... They're undiscovered. They're, like... These videos that these of these songs are just amazing, and they only have like two hundred views. Oh my! And I, I sit here and I'm like, I'm like, this is why I wish I had the huge numbers of subscribers. That way, so I could help people like that. Because I've been in that situation. Because I'm in that situation now. I I would say I have a fairly decent amount of subscribers, and then like when I see someone with less subscribers than me, because I want to, I want to push them up as far as I can. Do do my part. Because I remember starting out with three or four subscribers or ten subscribers and wanting people to help me. And then I've had people help me. I've contacted people, have gotten into the mix. Mm. And then it, it, it's slow, but slow, but sure, it goes up. Like, it helps. So, you know, if, if, if people helped me in the past, I want to help people so that they can be all they can be because I want them to experience what it's like. I don't care who you are. When you, when you get an email saying you have a new subscriber on YouTube, it's, you can't help but smile. Yeah, it makes me giggle. Me as well. <laughs> like every t- every time I see it, like I always get happy. Like every time someone comments on one of my songs and they like it, I that's what I do. That's I guess you could say that's my inspiration. I want I want to make people smile, and the best way I know how to do that is through music. So when someone comments saying that they liked a song or that a song made the day or that it made them smile, I can go to sleep that night feeling accomplished, knowing that I had achieved my goal. Wow, that is very inspirational. <laughs> yep. And talking about orchestral cover, I do like a lot of orchestral music. A few examples is, um, do you know the One Wing Angel team? I do not. 
oh, it's a Final Fantasy VII theme for one of the character called Sifrot. And the One Wing Angel song is really good. Might have to check that out. It's kind of overplayed around where I am, but it's still really awesome. Yeah, it's, it's good. Like everyone in t- in my university likes to use because it, it has an epic feel. So every time they want to make an epic, um, you know, assignment video, oh. like all there, and you know, you're watching every video. It's like these people don't have YouTube accounts and stuff to find better music and that. From an artistic standpoint, the song is really good. But from a general point of view, if you're using that as your presentation music, use something else. Yeah. <laughs> But that song is really good. You should take a listen. The first time I heard that song was because somebody asked me to put it in their presentation. Oh. <laughs> okay. On to the next question. Actually, just before that, I'd like to add, because, um, all of this um, creative expressions of music, Norman actually opened up my mind to something new. If you know who Search Tank Kid from System of a Down, correct? Yep. Yeah, yes. he showed me the DVD of his orchestral music that he composed as in Search Tankian writes orchestral music and I was watching it I was like what is in this guy's brain how does he do this he can write amazing metal songs and he can write orchestral songs and he can write orchestral covers of those metal songs and sing it <laughs> yeah I forgot to mention him he is another good one like th- I He's got no amazing. idea like I have a man crush on him like seriously his voice and his song are really powerful Okay, and my next question is, how long have you been doing orchestral cover? Um, I've been doing orchestral covers of songs for not very long, probably like four or five months. Just I just found my niche, and that's it's just it just comes natural to me, and so I just I just go with it as it comes, and it hasn't stopped yet. So like you know I haven't hit a a block yet where I can't write anymore, mm. but like it just it's just been coming not for very long, but it's been coming surely. Oh, okay, cool. So, how do you do those covers? Like, what kind of program do you use? Um, I use Mixcraft 6 for my strings, and I use the Edural Orchestra as the VSTi. Um, so, which, I use, which, which VST do you use? Um, Edural Orchestra. It's a really powerful production. Like, it's one of the best virtual instrument programs that I've ever heard. It's amazing. I love it. Okay. Because <laughs> I use Mixcraft 6 as well. Oh, I love Mixcraft. It's my favorite program. <laughs> Ever since uh, we had a previous guest, Scarlet Peace, who's been involved in My Little Remix as well, she told us about Mixcraft 6. I said, i got to look this up. And when I used it, I'm like, all right, forget it. I'm not using anything else. Mixcraft 6 is the way to go. Oh, yeah. It's an easy program. It's really powerful, and it's simple. Like, that's why I love it, because it's a, it's a simple program, but you can do so much with it. Yeah, until we interviewed um, Scarlet, every musician that's been on our show is always... Fruity Loops, Fruity Loops, Fruity Loops, Fruity Loops, Fruity Loops. Oh, so I can't stand Fruity Loops. Wait, wait, wait. We, we did have one that used, uh, what's that powerful one? Okay. FL Studio. Fruity Loops is FL Studio. Fruity Loops? So FL, what? that's what Fruity Loops stands for. Oh, what did Emilio use? FL. FL Studio? Fruity Loops? Yeah. I've been to his house, I've seen how he makes it. So, like, why is it that my... It's extremely group? powerful, but it's not user-friendly. Oh. No, it's it's professional software, like, you have... People, like it's it was designed for like people with like for sound engineers the knowledge and all that it's really really yeah. powerful but it's not something you can open up and understand oh no not at all like I have it because my friend uses it but I only use it to open like up up in a piano roll just so I can help him with a melody or something well I can't stand the piano roll with that I always yeah, use four mode in craft I was brought up on classical music education as well so I'm more used to the staff rather than the piano roll yeah I'm sure you are as well right yeah, I can't compose on a piano roll. I mean, <laughs> if I'm, like, in a hurry and I'm really trying to get something done, like, just to get a melody, melody down, I'll use the piano roll just to get the notes on the on the paper, so to speak. And then after that, I'll transpose it to the staff, and then I'll go from there. Okay, right. cool. So how long does it take for you to finish a track? It usually depends, like, because the tracks I've worked on with Ali, like the My Little Sister, The Adventurer, and our newest one, Her Only Fear, those have taken... Like, I know the first one, the the track that we did called My Little Sister, only took a few hours to do. But that's because, like, she she already had the guitar chords down. And then I just took the chords from her and then composed music to it and then recorded it. And it was, it went fairly quick. It took about five or six hours to do that. The one after that was The Adventurer. That one took, that one took a little longer. I think that one took around seven hours. And then Her Only Fear was a big project. It took almost 13 hours to do from start to finish. Hmm. And then as far as the orchestral songs, those can take, those take anywhere from one day to one month. Ooh. Like the, the big one that I did, the Grand Powerful Show, 
the big Trixie tribute that I did, that one took an entire week. It was like a straight week of just writing. And it was one of my favorite songs that I've ever done just because, well, one, I love Trixie, and two, it's, it's the first actual, like, movement production that I did where, like, with actual movements, but actually telling a story to the song. Okay. So, JD, here's my last question. And what was your reaction when we invited you onto our show? Oh, I was excited. <laughs> This is the second interview that I've been on, and it's amazing. I love talking to people about music and just... I just love talking in general. It's... <laughs> like, <laughs> seriously, give me an excuse to talk. I'll, I'll go on for hours. But, like, you and I but like yeah. Out very well. <laughs> yes! <laughs> wow. In, in awesome. all seriousness, like, yes, I was I was really excited and thrilled that I, that I, that you guys asked me to be on the show. Like, and I was freaking out because I got your message on YouTube, and it was like, we've been trying to reach you for a while. I was like... I'm so sorry, I haven't been in contact. Oh, cool. Because the only email I had access to was the project email. Yeah, and my friend, my friend Seth was running that, and he was out of the country <laughs> for a while. <laughs> so have you heard of our show before? Yes, I have, actually. I saw it, um, I saw it somewhere. Um, EQD? Yes. It, yeah. it was in, I want to say it was in the nightly roundup, but I it don't is. think it was. It is. Well, it always was in the nightly roundup. It's never been anywhere else. I saw it somewhere, and then I feel so bad because, like, I would always be like, I want to listen to a, sh- I want to listen to an episode or two just to, like, hear what's going on because, like, I love keeping up with um, all the new stuff, all the podcasts as much as I can, just so because I don't want to miss anything. And like, I just, I never did, and I was just like, like, I would always see it. I would just be like, it, it was, it's in my iTunes. Huh? Really? So, like, I clicked cool. on one to keep it there, and then I was just like, to it soon when I'm not busy, I, I will, and I just never got around to listening to it. You, sir, have just made my day or night. <laughs> we got to subscribe on iTunes. Yay! Oh, but seriously, wow. <laughs> wow. I got no idea what to say. Like, wow. <laughs> well, you have Malaysian fans. Indeed. Yes! The music is now heard halfway across the world. <laughs> okay, anyway, those are my questions. And thanks for answering them. Oh, no problem. So, now let's move on over to my questions. So, first up, what made you choose music as a career? Um, music's just always been something that's resonated with me. Like I've always just I've always like been listening to songs and it's never just listening to a song to listen to a song. It's always been like I would listen to a song and be like, Oh, I like that bass track or I like the drums in this, I like the vocal harmonies. And, and it's been that way for as long as I can remember. And then like my older my dad got my older sister a small acoustic guitar just to practice on just I think she said she wanted one or something. I really don't remember. And I'd always take it from her and I would listen to a song and then I would try to pick along like to the, to the melody or something. I would just go along and then I kind of developed an ear for music. Like I would just like play along on the same notes as like the vocal track or something on the guitar. And then it just went from there. I got a small little keyboard that I would just play stuff by ear. I started teaching myself to read cheat music and it's just been coming naturally ever since. Something I've discovered, a lot of people, a lot of musicians who are self-taught are really the ones who are really passionate about doing what they want to. Yes. Okay, so um, my second question is, what would your career path most probably be? I mean, if you're not comfortable answering this, it's fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer. Your dream job. My dream job would be to write music for movies. Like, that's... I want film to be scoring. a film composer. Yes, I want to do that so bad. I mean, it's not my only job. Like, I'm also really interested in the medical field. Oh. And, like, yeah, I took a lot of medical classes in high school and, like, sciences. Sciences in the medical field are just subjects that really resonate with me. I love I love sciences and I love anything about medicine. It's just fascinating to me. Psychoacoustics. <laughs> yeah. He's like, a medical also, musician. That's also a really good thing that I do in music. Like, I, I look at music from a really scientific point of view, like the physics of the sound waves and everything and how harmonies resonate with each other. And why they sound good and why they sound bad. Yeah, I was blessed to have a theory teacher like that. I, I made it all the way up to theory grade and failed. But um, basically, he also did a lot of the explanation. And sometimes after you get that explanation, it's hard to not think about it when you hear music. Yeah. <laughs> it just sticks in you. You start to overanalyze it. Okay, so um, next up, what instruments do you play? Oh, man. <laughs> I play a lot of instruments. I'll go in order from the first instrument I learned to the most recent one. Um, it started on the guitar, the acoustic guitar, and then I went to the piano, to the drums, to the bass guitar, to the trumpet, violin, cello. Um, did I say trumpet? Yes, yeah, I said trumpet. Um, I know there's more. It's not just those. You're like a one-man um, orchestra. 
<laughs> yeah, if, if I, well, because, like, I, I know how to play all the instruments. Like, I know the range, and I know all, like, how they can sound all the different tombas and everything. But, like, I wouldn't say I'm, like, exceptionally well, or, like, I'm exceptionally good at, an, at a lot of instruments. Like, I can play them, and, like, I can play them in front of people and record them and feel comfortable and feel happy with the sound, but I'm nowhere near professional. Like, some people can play, like, some people can play the guitar, they can play the crazy solos, or those crazy weird chords. I'm like, uh, I can play the chord progressions and I can read the music and I can I can play along and I can keep up with some stuff, but I'm not the best. And but you play oh, a lot. I do. I also play the alto saxophone. Like wow. that's my most recent instrument that I picked up. Yeah, I noticed. I mean, saxophone has been quite an exotic instrument here. Oh yeah. So now, if you play one, you're like that epic sax guy. <laughs> yes. Do you record yourself playing? And if you do, what is your ratio of recorded music to virtual instruments in your music that you make? I haven't recorded myself playing any of like my classical instruments, like the trumpet or the saxophone or anything like that. Just because, to me, like just recording, like like for the trumpet, like if I were just to play the trumpet track and record it four separate times and use that as an ensemble, it wouldn't resonate well with the virtual instrument since there's not a, there's not other real instruments playing along with it in the background so i i just think getting the levels right and trying to resonate it just wouldn't sound like i've tried it before and it just i never could get it to sound real right. like the real trumpet sounded more synthetic than the virtual instruments just because okay. there were just the same trumpet recorded four times to give it different tombas ah, I see. over the virtual instruments that are already pre-mastered and you know scored correctly and just like professionally played it just has a weird resonance to it and it, it i just it never sat well with me but I have recorded myself playing the drums, the acoustic and electric guitar, and the bass guitar, and myself singing, and use those with virtual tracks like strings or brass. Like it works with the voice Alley, very I, well. It does. You create it your really own does. ensemble of voice. I realize that. Yes. So sometimes when I'm finished with my vocal recording, I just throw in all my takes together and hear my own like choir of myself. <laughs> Although those people, although I, I, I screw up myself at certain places, it sounds like, this is pretty natural. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, last one, have you ever performed any of your own compositions live, as in towards an audience, formally or informally? Ooh, I've never performed any of the orchestral pieces live, but I have done, like, little acoustic sets of the songs that Ali and I have done at, like, an open mic night here, like, at a coffee shop here in town, just, like... I'll just play like the acoustic, just play the acoustic guitar, just the chords along, and then I'll sing the lyrics to it. And it makes me wish that Ali lived here, or I live where she lives, just so we could perform live together. Because like we, we've collaborated on so many tracks, we've done so much together, and we're doing a lot more together. And like she's one of like the most, she's like the most brilliant girl I've ever had the privilege to work with, and I love every minute with it. Well, there's Google Plus for that. Yeah. <laughs> Next question would be, have you ever been to a PonyCon? I know I asked you this before the show started, but now they were in uh, No, I haven't been to a BronyCon or any Brony conventions for that matter yet. But I do plan on going. Like, I'm trying to go to Equestria LA, and then there is a convention coming up in May that's going to be in, in Florida, and I'm going to try to go to that one. And then the next actual BronyCon, I am definitely going. Like, I'm not taking no finance. I am going to the next BronyCon. So, um, has being a brony affected your love for music in any way? Has it affected it in any way? I'm going to have to say yes, because it's, it's made me appreciate a broader style of music, because I've heard fandom music before, and usually, like, one fandom will stick with just metal music or just classical music. I one heard, style, is it? Yeah, exactly. Like, I've heard literally almost every genre of music in the brony community and it's all good like it's all really well done like, yep, the yep. fandom never ceases to amaze me okay so now i'm gonna confront you with something if you could only work with one of the following musicians would you pick a stephen andrews b william anderson or c daniel ingram oh man that's not fair Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh... okay um if you do not know stephen andrew does orchestral for the show Okay, oh, man. I, I love Daniel's musical numbers. I love okay, um, score design. I would have to say Daniel Ingram. That way I could play the bass guitar in one of the tracks. Awesome. <laughs> Good start, <choice, laughs> Brent. I would have to say Daniel Ingram just so I could help write the score and then I could also help play it too. 
we would love, I would love to see that happen, man, really. Uh, I, Dan, I love Daniel Ingram. He is amazing. Yeah, he brings Daniel, the word Daniel, to a whole new level. <laughs> <laughs> and he is the original one. Yeah, he has, he's the only one with the right to say that. So, um, like my, my next few questions are, are going to be about the Long Way From Equestria project. All right. So, uh, what inspired you to take it on? Um, uh, well, I've heard, like, because I heard the Massive Smile project, which was, I'm sure everyone knows, but just in case there's those two people that don't know, the Massive Smile project was this, ma- literally, this massive project of the smiles, of uh, uh, Pinkie Pie's Smile, Smile, Smile song, and it was just... It had a lot of famous Bruni musicians like Mike the Microphone, Living Tombstone, Wooden Toaster, just all these famous musicians Jamie singing. Nicholson. Yes, Jamie Nicholson just singing solos from the Smile song, and it was just brilliant. And then there was just, I think they said the chorus was it was either over a hundred or over two hundred people in the chorus, just all of these people just singing the chorus to the Smile song, and it was just beautiful. Was it massive. It was huge, and it, it was. It was just brilliant. Like, it brought tears to my eyes. It was beautiful. And then after hearing that, I was like, okay, that's done with a canon song. What if something like that was done with a fan-made song? And I, I could not think of a better song than Mando Pony's Long Way from Equestria, just because it's... With, it's a whenever I say anthem. It's a real broken It is. Anthem. It is. Whenever I say Mando Pony, all the time, people are like, oh, he wrote Long Way from Equestria. And I'm like, yes, exactly. Because it's that song just resonates with everyone because, you know, even non-bronies that I've showed that song to, they, they love it just because of its message, how it's just like these, this, these two people, this guy and this girl, just being themselves, just being happy like through all of this crap that's getting handed to them. Like, and they're just, they're not caring what anyone else thinks about them. They're saying, you know what? I'm happy. This is happy. We're a long way from, we're really far from everyone happy. being happy, like how they are here, but it's, it's coming. Yes, exactly. It's I I can I'm at a loss for words of it. Like that song still resonates with me really hard. I think it's one song that's really burned into the back of every brony's head. Yes, Regardless exactly. Regardless if they like it or not, it's there. Yeah, I mean it's at the level where you remember it as much as you remember the theme song. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you took on auditions. How fast did the solo parts fill up? The male solo parts filled up fairly quick. Like it took probably like two weeks or like a week or two weeks for them to fill up and then it they filled up so fast like we went through all the auditions and then after like when we were like talking it over like we were still getting auditions even after they were closed and uh it was it was really hard to send um those people sorry. saying sorry because like there were a lot of really good voices that kept coming in but the auditions already closed and we're like well they sent in everything so they're definitely going to be in the chorus and then, like, the, the female auditions, solo female auditions, they filled up a little slower, but they still filled up fairly quick. Like, we had some awesome female soloists. Like, I apologize if I'm saying her name wrong, but, like, her name's Miss... Miss Aikira Shippa. Uh, I can never say her name right, and I feel so bad, but she's really awesome. She does a lot of covers of the canon songs, and she has, a, she has, she has like, a soprano voice, and she sings really beautifully... It's actually through the Long Way From Equestria project is how I met Ali, because she, like, because I heard one of the songs, and I actually sent her a message saying, hey, you should audition for this project, because we need a lot more female voices, and yours is really beautiful. And she was like, oh, thanks, okay. She sends in her audition, and I was like, oh, wow, she's a really, really good singer. Like, I might be a little biased saying this, just because I've worked with her so much lately, but I think she is one of the best vocalists that I've ever heard. Like, Wow. It's, it sounds so cheesy, but I could, I seriously, I could listen to her voice just for days. Like, I never get tired of hearing her voice. Like, when we're, when I'm producing a track that we worked on and I'm having to listen to her, her vocal track over and over again, I don't get tired of it. I, I get tired of the music before I get tired of her voice. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, like, I'll sit here and I'm like, I've heard this bass line a hundred times. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I and then, like, you I feel. just keep listening to her voice in the background, and they're like, okay, like, it doesn't bother me. Just isolate it in your acapella or something? Yes, because, like, cause, like, she always has to send in an acapella track so I can put over the music, and, like, I always do a quick run-through just to listen to the acapella track just to make, just to see if there's, like, if she hit a sharp note or something or anything. She hasn't yet, like, seriously, like, every acapella track she sends in has been Perfect. flawless as far as, like, pitch and tonality-wise goes. Like, I've never had to send an acapella track back to her saying, um, in this measure, on this note, 
it was really flat, you re-record. <laughs> I just never had to do it. Do you have to actually auto-tune any of the parts for the project? No, I refuse to auto-tune any <laughs> of the parts, actually. Praise Celestia for that. <laughs> you want to know something funny? Um, Daniel Ingram does that for his songs. Well, yeah, but like, he has a good reason to, because it's not easy to hit those notes in that voice. No, no, the thing is, Shannon Cat... Shannon Chan Ken. Yeah, Shannon Chan Ken. She always said this in her mind, like, Oh, auto-tune sucks, I will not do auto-tune. And when singing for Daniel Ingram, sing, I don't know what song she sang, but every time when she sang a song, she didn't hit the note. She will always go to Daniel and say, Oh, you'll fix that in post. You'll fix that in post. <laughs> Fix it in post. That, that's something we hear a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fix, it, fix it in post. But like <laughs> the way I see it, I don't. Auto tune isn't a crutch. It's an effect. Like if you're gonna use it, you better sound like T Pain or like Gladys <laughs> from Portal. Yeah. Like if auto tune is, if you're gonna use it, it better be over the top. Because like I'm not gonna lie, I've used it before, but as an effect. Like I'll, like I've have like I've covered Portal songs like a long time ago. Like when Portal One came out, like. Me and my friends did a cover of, um, uh, what's it called? Still Alive. Mm. And, like, we couldn't, like, we listened to it. We were like, we just, the voice doesn't sound right. And then my friend Seth, who's also on the project with me, he was like, guys, it needs to be auto-tuned. We were like, uh. (laughs) And then, like, we used it. And, like, we cranked it up all the way. And it was just (laughs) robotic and choppy. And it was was awesome. Like, I see auto-tune as, like, if you aren't happy with your voice and you need to use auto-tune. Singing ain't your thing. Pretty much, yeah. I'm, we're, I'm probably going to get a lot of heat for that, but if you have to use auto-tune to sound good, singing's just not your thing. This this is an argument that goes back to when singing was invented. People who think they can sing and the people who can't sing. It's like, because like, there's some people that have good voices, they're told they can sing, and they know they can sing, but you know they're not going to be rude about it. They're going to be like, oh... Thanks. Like, they, they'll be like, they, they may not be happy with their voice, but their voice sounds good to other people. And then there's some people that cannot sing, that just keep singing. And then, like, when you tell them they can't sing, they take it like you just, Stand like, an insult. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, because I've had people tell me that I can't sing, and I'm like, okay, I know I don't have the best voice, but I know I don't have the worst either. <laughs> I mean, singing's not really my thing. If I don't have to sing, I won't. I'm an instrumentalist, but I'll sing backup and I'll sing harmonies. Like like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, but some people, some people like Dusty. They use auto tune just because they can't reach that tone. Like no matter how hard they try, they just can't reach it. So yeah, one, but that's, that it's a, it's kind of using it as a tweak. They don't heavily apply it to the song until your song sounds like you're playing it on a keyboard. Oh yeah, like yeah. it's it's a tool. Correct me if I'm wrong. It was designed to be a crutch. No, not really. It's designed to be an effect. The first popular autotune song was done by Cher. I think I learned today because I always thought that because when I first heard about autotunes, it was on Rick D's Top 40 and he was mm. always telling us that oh, now there's going to be this new technology that allows artists to sing in tune no matter how bad they are. I'm like, seriously? Now see, that explanation throws me off because I'm like, allows people to sing no matter how bad they are. <laughs> We're going to get a lot of repetitive... Okay, because like you can't use robotic sounding auto tune on a song with a piano and violins. Like, yeah, that's no. gonna clash. I mean, no. if you have like an eight bit song going with like glitch in the background, you know, electronica. Yeah, go for it. Use auto tune. It's cool. It's an effect. True, true. There was an app that came out for iPad that has a built in auto tune uh, preset engine, I... and I was like, let's push this to its limit. I turned it on. And I was like, they were like. Okay, this software is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think the best autotune artist is T Pain. Yeah, he uses it as an T Pain uses it as an effect. Like he's even said, like he says, because I've heard because he can sing live. From what I hear, I've never heard him sing live, but from what I can hear, he has a fairly decent voice. Even Black Eyed Peas uses it, don't, don't they? Yeah, they do. It's pop music. Who doesn't use it? <laughs> but Black Eyed Peas yeah. is a real experimental feel. That's what I like about them. Even though sometimes they're repetitive, I like their their ability and their guts to actually experiment. Oh, yeah. So, uh, next question, coming back to the project. What was Mando's initial response to your decision to take on the project? He loved it. He was excited. Like, I sent him a message just asking him for permission to use the song and the project. And 
his response, he was just like, yeah, go for it. Send me a link when it's done. I want to hear it. Like, he was on board. Wow. Is he helping out as well? He's not helping now, and I completely understand because he's so busy with all the yeah. stuff he has to do. But he's he, he does know of the project, and he does approve, so I'm happy. <laughs> oh, cool. Yep. So uh, how many people are in this project at the time being, counting all the production staff, the vocalists, chorus, and soloists, including yourself? Well, the production staff is really just myself and my friend Seth, and Seth is just like a consultant. Like, he's just helping with, like... A few of the things, like, I had a few of my friends, like, from my music class to be, like, some judges. Because uh, my friend Angel was on the, we call it the judges board. She She's the vocal major. Like, she's majoring in music performance and as, as a vocalist. Wow, vocal, vocal and, major. Yeah. Like, she she can sing. Like, she knows, she knows all the science behind singing. Like, she can sing. And, like, I, it was myself... Actually, no, I didn't put myself on the judges panel because I was too busy writing the instrumental at the time. <laughs> it was, I, I listened to a few of them when I could, but I didn't really make any final decisions. Um, it was Seth, Angel, and then my friend Sam. They were the three that would listen to the tracks and then send the ones that they liked my way and then the ones that they were kind of iffy about. And then, like, so I guess four people on production staff, but Angel and Sam aren't helping with the with the engineering of the track or anything, they were just the listeners and they're going to help with the mastering later. So it's, it's really just Seth and I and, and really doing a lot. He's being lazy, but that's Seth. <laughs> so what about the singers? Um, as far as the singers go, I honestly couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I'm, ass- I'm assuming because the last time I opened the project folder was when I was looking at the vocalists just to get a head count. And I think the number for solos and co- choruses was around 20-something. Ooh, wow. Ooh, nice. I mean, I, I, I guess I should probably know how many people are in my project, but, like, it hasn't gone up or down lately. It hasn't really fluctuated any, and we've just been working so hard on the instrumental because the original instrumental that we're using got completely wiped, and we can't find it anywhere. Wait, what? <laughs> The, the original instrumental that I, that's up on my YouTube, um, the the instrument tracks, like the actual tracks, oh. that, the production tracks, we can't find them anywhere. We have no idea where where the files are. You didn't even manage to grab a media of it. We can't find it. Like we thought it was on, we thought it was on a separate hard drive. Then when we plugged it in, it wasn't there. Oh no! And we're just like, uh, I mean, we can't, we're using it as a as a pushing mechanism to kind of push us to say, okay, let's write a new instrumental. I say let's, but I'm talking about me. Mark <laughs> two. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm, like, I'm using it as, like, just something to, like, you know what? It was the, it was one of the first tracks I wrote. And, for I mean, for being one of the first tracks I wrote, it got a lot of high praise. And I am, I'm thrilled that people are still listening to it today, six months later, you know? And, like, we're just going to redo it. We're going to use real instruments. We're going to use, like, real guitar, real bass, real drums, um, real piano. Still the virtual orchestra because no one has an orchestra in their pocket they can use. Yeah. I will. <laughs> That's the thing also I like to ask musicians. Don't you wish you had a personal orchestra? <laughs> oh, I, I do and I don't. I do because it would give it such a real sound and it would just be beautiful. And then I don't because then you have to rehearse. <laughs> I have been caught by my parents in my room with my conductor's baton, like, <laughs> conducting orchestra music and having my headphones on, cranked up to maximum, and they're like, what are you doing? And I didn't, don't respond because I'm so deep into the music. <laughs> wow, Daniel, you know what you said just now? It could take a wrong turn. Oh, yeah. that, was my, that was my intention. <laughs> it's a guilty pleasure, really. And yeah. I, catch myself, I catch myself doing conducting a lot. Okay. <laughs> but then um, when I actually had to conduct my choir once, I failed epically. <laughs> because, uh, you know, they tell, they, the our conductor tell, told me this golden rule. Daniel, don't conduct your part. <laughs> conduct the choir. Every yeah. day the floor. <laughs> okay, so after the Long Way From Equestria project is released, would you be motivated to do it again with another song or maybe with an original song of yours? Ooh, that's a tough one. Well... I guess I guess it'll really all depend on how this project goes. Like, if it gets a lot of high praise and people want more fan-made songs like that, then sure, yeah, I can try to do it. Like, I might even if it if it takes off as much 
as I hope it will, I could probably even use like enough people on YouTube who play enough instruments to get a full real like it it all be real instruments, like nothing synthetic. You mean an internet orchestra? Exactly. Wow. I haven't, I haven't heard of a project like that since. I, were you part of the YouTube Symphony Orchestra? Yes, I. Oh, I wasn't part of it, but I have heard of it. Ah, uh, all right. Yeah, it would be something like that. Yeah. So uh, finally, um, the last question to do with the project would be: Are you considering maybe after or at the moment a partnership with animators like uh, Brony Dance Party, Mr. Ponyeto, or even Kokoneru for that matter to animate the final project? Oh. I'm not going to say one way or the other, but if they are willing to animate the project, I won't say no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was it was it Brony Dance Party? They did the, what do you call it, the Massive Smile project, right? Yeah, Brony Dance Party did do the Massive Smile project. He did the animation for it. Yeah, that was... When you see that big, huge choir full of OCs, you're like, hair standing. It's, like, it's beautiful. Wow. If I remember right, Kokuneru doesn't do animation. Oh, that was, um, I think Kanashi Panda did that. Oh, not him? No, he... No, Coco, Coco didn't animate it. Oh, he uses, they, they put his OC in it, is that, that's why? I think so, yeah. Oh, all right. I don't know, I, I, because I've I talked to Coco and Kanashi before, like, I'm in a chat with them and their group of friends, and we all talk a lot, and I know Kanashi Panda is an animator, and he does a lot of really good animation, like, really good animations, and I, I can't remember if he did... Pony Gangnam style or not? I, I can't remember for the life of me. All I remember I is think he did. all I remember is Kokuneru just posted the video on his page. Da yeah. No, da is it YouTube? Both. Is that oh. he has the flash on his da? Oh. So other than that, I got no idea. And for that reason, no offense, Kokuneru. I thought you were Korean. <laughs> no offense. <sighs> I was like, oh, there's a Korean brony now doing the Gangnam Style. Because that was the first was ever instance of the Gangnam Style I heard. I thought Coco was Korean. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the same boat. Wait. Is he not? I'm pretty sure he is. Okay, let me go to his page and look at his YouTube. Oh, gosh. Wait. I mean, he's in the States, I, I think. Oh, well, now I'm all confused. Give me a second. Okay. Um, okay. Maybe he is in... Is he Korean born? Sorry. He is I in think, the United States. Yes, he is. He is Korean. Okay, I'm correct. No, but yes. he is in the United States. Yeah, he's in the States, but he is Korean. Oh boy, this is going to be this is going to be a fun outtake. Norman, I'm Chinese Indian, but I'm in Malaysia. But I'm a Chinese. <laughs> and I'm in, this is going us. Okay. 1957 all over again. Uh, cut, let's cut this out. This is so stupid. <laughs> cut. Edit. Oh, we'll fix it in post. We'll fix it in post. Yeah, fix it in post. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next few questions could be edited out. These are just extremely random, all right? First of all, all right. I love the hat. Is it Applejack inspired? The fedora? No, it's not Applejack inspired. Wait, you, you're saying a fedora? Yeah, he wears a hat in his video, the fedora, yeah. Yeah, he said a fedora. I think it's the official hat of the bronies. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's the fedora because it, um, every free Northwest, everyone... Everyone was wearing a fedora. Time for me to get one then. <laughs> Do it. They're awesome. Now I'm known for my messy, whacked up hairstyle. Out of bed. <laughs> nice. Okay, I'm not going to ask the second question because he's already slapped me for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you want to know, would you consider yourself a hipster? You sure look like one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I refuse. I refuse to be called a hipster just because that name implies that because the name hipster just implies that you are pretentious and a jerk. And, I mean, I don't I don't really know how people see me. I mean, in all honesty, I really don't care how people see me. But I would prefer... I would prefer... It's a good sense of style. Like, I mean, it's comfortable. I like it. I like the style sense. But, you know, I don't sit there going around, Oh, have you heard of this band? Oh, that's right. You probably never heard of them. Or, oh, I've heard that before. It was cool. I'm like, no, you're just, that's just pretentious and that's just rude. Nobody I mean, likes that. that. I do that a lot. Like, have you all heard this amazing song? It's by this guy named Andrew Stein. They're like, who the hell is Andrew Stein? <laughs> yeah, but that's not being a hipster. That's like, if somebody, like, if you just sit here, like, with some, like, really, like, randomly a new band on your iPod and then, like, somebody comes up and says, oh, I've never heard of that band. Or they say, who is that? And then you say, I mean, because you can be polite and say, oh, they're on YouTube. They're not really well-known. This this is their name. Go look them up. They're cool. 
Or you could be a hipster and go, you've never heard of them. <laughs> oh, I, just like, I do that like, to people who overload on mainstream music, but the people who really can appreciate, yeah, I'll be, okay, go check out the YouTube. They're like, mainstream folks, they go into my car, they see my media player, they keep pressing the next button until they see something mainstream, which there are only about three mainstream songs in my playlist. <laughs> Yeah, uh, go next, 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 next. Anything with the album art with a pony on it, they won't listen to it. You go next, 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 uh, next, 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 next. Suddenly there's train. Ah, okay. No, I don't want to sound next, 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 next. Oppa, Gangnam Style. Nope, next, 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 next. <laughs> to be honest, in my iPhone, the only mainstream song is, let's see, uh, The Touch. That's about it. <laughs> um, oh, mine has the, the Aerosmith one and Don't Want to Miss a Thing because it's our high school like anthem. But like, do you guys know who who's... The, Sorry. What um what's that what's that movie you call the one the one that had it uh Blades of Glory and then played in school. <laughs> but do you know what song is the touch from? What movie or what song? Yeah, that's oh, right. that's from Transformers, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, that's the it's only from the old Transformers show. Yeah, oh. that's the only mainstream I have. I've got to hear that now. It's a good song. I have it on my iTunes as well. Because mine, mine has uh, the, the other Transformers songs, the new ones by Linkin Park. Uh, mainstream. Oh, I love Linkin Park. There's nothing wrong with mainstream. No, Linkin Park is really good because I like their experimental attitude as well. No, I mean, it's... I don't know, like, Linkin Park... Hyper Gear was an explosive album. I don't know why, but I don't really like Linkin Park anymore. <laughs> anymore is a different story, but... I yeah, like, I mean, the, the newer stuff kind of did drop off a little bit. I haven't heard their most recent album, so... Mm. Yeah, neither have I. <laughs> and as the, now the other band that's becoming extremely experimental would be Muse. <laughs> oh, yeah. The second law, that is crazy stuff. Gone into dubstep all of a sudden, like, wow. Hey, have you Very noticed mainstream it. music is using dubstep now? Uh, that's not dubstep. I mean, yeah, but it's... it's, it's Skrillex it's... is not dubstep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Skrillex it's... is hard trance. But I've been listening to mainstream radio and they are using dubstep in a few of their tracks. Yeah, like snippets, but not a full dubstep song. Yeah. yeah. Nobody well, can get the Tombstone. Dubstep, go look for Silverhound. Or Tombstone. Oh, yeah. Tombstone is good. No. Yeah, Tombstone <laughs> as well, but Tombstone has Tombstone has a wide spectrum, but Silverhound specializes in dubstep and then he's good at it. Oh, yeah. He's the best dubstep <laughs> artist I've ever heard. But Mendo is trying to do dubstep now. Oh, that, that, that stuff is interesting. I can't wait to see the final product of that. I think he did one. He did one. I think it was called uh, Vinyl's Bad Day. Oh. But he also tried He also tried on the other one that came on Balloon Party, Breaking Bonds. All right. So, David, would you be coming to Malaysia anytime soon? <laughs> if I had the money and I had a passport, I totally would. Yay. What if there was, what if there was going to be a pony con here? Would that motivate you a little more? Mm, if there was a con there, I would consider going... But if I was invited there, like as a guest of honor, I would try my hardest to go. <laughs> now we know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what's your friend's full name? As in the one who manages the email inbox, your friend Seth. You know, for a second really? I thought it was Seth from EQD. Oh no, I haven't. The only time I've even like, I guess we would say talked to Seth on EQD would be if I'm submitting a track <laughs> to a question. Yeah, but what is your friend, as in your friend, Seth, the guy who manages the email for the project, what is his full name? <laughs> really? You want to ask that? I know that, that um, the EQD one is Sean Scottellero, but then, yeah. I mean, this is kind of <laughs> private, yo. I mean, if it's, if it's private, then we can cut it out, but yeah. <laughs> uh, his name's Seth Johnson. He's a, he's a really good friend of mine. We go back a long time. He's, it's funny, because he's not a brony. He appreciates the show, and he respects it, but he, like, he, he did watch a few episodes, and he just said, and he was like, I'm sorry, man. I just, honestly, I just don't like it. And I was like, okay, I can respect that. And he's yeah, leading he, the project. He's helping the project because I'm, I'm working on it and I asked him for help. <laughs> but, I mean, like, because he, he likes the song. He loves the fandom. He loves the stuff that the fandom does. He just <laughs> doesn't like the show. All right, then. So that's a wrap for all our questions this week. I'm trying to think of a question right now. Something popped in and then it went away. I have, that, I have that every week, Norman. Huh. I guess it's a co-host thing. Indeed. <laughs> yep. So you can check Base Beast out on YouTube and Twitter. His links are in the show notes. Go subscribe to him. He wants to make people feel good. Just subscribe and share, <laughs> share, share. Sharing is caring. You got to share. You got to care. So now let's go on over to our little inbox, which seems to be ringing with nothing inside of it. Oh, there were some, but it's like, you have one new subscriber on YouTube. Or Daniel Anthony has just mentioned you on Twitter. <laughs> yes. 
Right, so if you want to reach us, you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at the MBS show at gmail.com. And remember, if you want to direct any uh, hate mail to me because I say I didn't like Luna Eclipse, you direct it to my personal Twitter. Don't put it in the show's inbox. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, so, boys, do we have any shout-outs to make? Um, David, how about you go first? Who would you like to shout-out? Oh, yes, to? I have a shout-out. My awesome vocalist and my awesome shipping partner, Ali Eves to 27. Ali, I love you. You're awesome. And I cannot wait to work on more tracks with you later. All right. Any more? Mm, no, I'm good. All right. Norman, how about you? Ooh, I do have two. And, well, I'll just combine them into one. Um, my shout out is to Michelle Krieber and Monique Krieber for sending me my CD. It's awesome. <laughs> just got it yesterday and... Well, there's a crack on the casing, but the disc is still okay, and I got an autograph by them. Well, actually by Michelle, but still, awesome! So last but not least, one shout out from me to Ethan Powell, the boss of Alicorn Radio. Thank you very much for the chats that we had this week. Great stuff, we learned so much, and of course, we can't wait to work more with you in the near future. Yep, yep. So, once again, our email, if you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions, hit us up, Show at gmail.com. You can also reach us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at show. My handle is at St. Pinky, S-T-P-I-N-K-I-E, spell it right. Not Sergeant, Saint. Hey, ah. well, and I'm at Norman Sanzo. Uh, David? What? Oh, <laughs> and I'm at BaseBeastJD. And also, please subscribe to us on iTunes, rate us, and also drop a like on our Facebook page. Both links are found in the show notes. If you want to reach us on iTunes, just search for The MBS Show. We are searchable on all iOS devices. And yes, we work on iOS 6 as well. Yay. Not like the Maps app. <laughs> <laughs> no comment on that one. <laughs> no, you, put, you type in Norman Sanzo and then you get, like, Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> wow! What am I doing there? Wi-Fi signal is better at home. <laughs> Yes, Let's end this. <laughs> All right, then. That's been the MBS show for the week. My name is Daniel Anthony. I've been Norman Sanzo. And I'm David. We'll see you next week. See ya.
can see how passionate they are. They change their Twitter profile pictures to their ponytails. <laughs> Indeed. So here's to you. Um, now when I want the names, I forget them. Sibzi. Sibzi is a storyboard artist. Who's the scriptwriter? Scriptwriter. Scriptwriter. Megan McCartney. Megan McCartney. Who's the other one? Uh, I, I don't remember. Not M. A. Larson. Uh, uh. Oh, you're putting so much effort in the part that I'm going to delete. <laughs> really? Are you going to delete the? Are you going to delete the what? The whole shout out to who? I'm, I just want to shout out to them. Um, yeah, I, but you need to do it well because this is uh, really derping out. Mm, uh, never. Uh, 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 never mind. Screw it. Let's just move on. <laughs> okay, write them down now. If you can remember, write them down now, and you can give a shout out in the shout out. You mentioned first, by the way. Uh, M.A. Larson. Not M.A. Larson. Sibzi. Not Sibzi, the one after... Megan Richard. McCartney. Megan McCarthy and, um... Who's the one that said this still had best... O- said had best OC? Um, I got no idea. Seriously, I don't remember. Not even Sarah Wall. Uh, Megan McCarthy and, uh, and, um... Who's the one that wanted to start Band of Bronies and... Megan. Okay, I'm really fail right now because I'm trying to remember who it was. I'm sorry. Amy Keating Rogers! Uh. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, JD. Rogers, yes. This doesn't okay. usually happen. Sorry, it's it's all good. This is what happened. Yeah, this is what Norman spoke of when you know when it's not scripted. This is what happens. So you wrote you wrote him down already? Yes. Okay, good boy. All right. <laughs> okay, three, two, one. So a big shout out to. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, wrote, I wrote Amy Keating Rogers and I forgot the other one. Megan McCarthy. Megan McCarthy. Alright, alright, alright. <laughs>